Good evening, everyone. My name is Luciana Chamor. I'm an affiliate researcher of Deep uh, Web for the artisan sector, and it's a great honor to welcome all of you all here um, as we celebrate the launch of the first series of case studies of artisan businesses and organizations. In the last, sorry, in the last two years, um, an eclectic um, team of five people came together under um, the leadership of Cinta Lawson Jaramillo um, to initiate the case studies of artisan supporting organizations that are, that are working to improve artisan livelihoods in emerging economies. You might be asking yourself, why the artisan sector? The artisans comprise the second largest sector of rural employment after agriculture, according to the US aid. Hundreds of thousands of people in the developing world, largely women, participate in the artisan sector. And as said by John Kerry as US Secretary of State, if you are looking for innovative ways to help developing countries flourish, artisans are a terrific place to be in. So tonight we have the great opportunity uh, to learn directly uh, from brilliant and inspiring panelists, including our Parsons professor and founders and directors of artisan organizations that were profiled in our first case study series. And they will talk about their challenges, um, their experiences and successes as they work for the betterment of the artisan sector. Uh, this is an ongoing project and we wanted to keep interviewing more and more organizations. And we, um, in the coming days, um, we will make available on our deep website the finished case studies. Um, which illustrate the, the diversity of artisans' um, supporting models. On a final note, I wanted to express my um, deepest gratitude to the team I have been working with and from whom I learned so much. It has been a, a lot of fun too. Um, Cinta Lawson Jaramillo, the director of D, um, Robert Barak, the uh, deep fellow and lead author of the case studies, Silvia Garuti, uh, deep research assistant and graphic designer, Elizabeth Bailey, affiliate researcher. Unfortunately, she could, you know, um, be here tonight with us. And Alec Mikhailin, former deep fellow. It has been an amazing um, journey. I will pass the microphone to Robert who will take, talk about the case studies a little bit uh, before we proceed with the panel and then we we'll follow with uh, one reception. Thank you. As a, as a true writer, I'm sitting here perfecting these remarks. <laughs> I hope you'll appreciate them. So the artisan sector is a $500 billion plus industry, according to some estimates. And yet the majority of indigenous artisans in particular are living in poverty and are socially isolated. Why then, uh, why, why is that the case? Right? For many organizations that employ artisans and seek to bring their goods to global markets, growth is the goal organizationally. More sales, of course, means more employment, uh, which may translate to more impact. But is growth the answer or the, the pathway? Or are smaller scale approaches more likely to address inequities? Those are the sort of grounding questions for tonight's conversation and panel, which we're delighted you, you've joined us for. Uh, like Luciana said, I'm Robert Barak. I'm a fellow at the D-Lab. I'm also a principal consultant at Brocade. At, Pittsburgh and Richmond-based consultancy. Um, early on in my, in my career, co-started a, a craft manufacturing accelerator called Monde, working to, hello, come on in. Nope, wrong room. Uh, 
to bring together craft manufacturers and real estate developers and, and other folks who were working with the built environment. We've had a lot of success there. So when there was an opportunity uh, for me, someone who's seen entrepreneurs, at least in the US, struggle, even in this sort of privileged context uh, where a lot of support exists, when there's an opportunity to, to turn some attention and curiosity to non-US examples of craft and artisans, along with the Deep Lab, who, whose work with um, organizations that engage indigenous and in particular women artisans has been long-standing. was excited at the, the prospect to dig into those organizational stories in particular. Uh, we've written some case studies before at the Kennedy School, and there's sort of a classic format if you've read a case study. Angelica is sitting in her office, and she sits back in her chair, looking out on the floor, wondering, will they meet the fourth quarter projections? Um, <laughs> When you read these tonight, you'll we've avoided all of that, really trying to get to the, the heart of what is going on in the, the five organizations um, that we've profiled and releasing tonight. Um, we sought to highlight, uh, welcome, uh, practices of excellence and real sort of authentic struggles, um, not sort of glossing over the real challenges that organizations in the sector are facing and grappling with. Of course, the, se the series which you'll, um, you'll get access to tonight and this week deals with wages, the role of artisans, production, and export questions. Uh, but a conversation across many of the case studies that stood out to us was the question and grappling with growth and scale. Is bigger necessarily better? Is scale the clearest, best pathway to making a difference? So we'll be talking about that tonight. Uh, as Luciana said, the first uh, series of case studies will be available on the D website this week. Um, if you haven't seen the sheet going around, um, please sign up. You'll get a notification when those case studies are live. You can also visit dbed.parsons.edu -E um, to see that series when it goes up later this week. Okay. And uh, the, the work of writing and case studies continues. Um, I'll be headed to Peru in just a few weeks to do some more in-depth case studies on a Peruvian-based artisan organization. So we're excited to, to continue the series and to get even deeper. So with uh, that prelude, I want to welcome uh, Cynthia Lawson, the D-Lab director, uh, to get the conversation going. Hi everyone, uh, thank you so much for being here. It's wonderful to, to have a full room and um, several people joining us on Instagram Live. And we're also documenting this, uh, so maybe people in the future are also seeing this. Um, it really uh, has been such a delight working with the team for the last two years. And so I wanna thank my colleagues, um, those of you who are here, as well as Elizabeth who could not be here tonight, um, for just catching on to the enthusiasm that I've had for the artisan sector working in this lab for the last 11 years and um, staying committed to, to this um, important area. Uh, what's exciting about being in New York City is we have access to so many founders. Currently in New York now, artisan resource, you know, the big trade shows are happening as well. Um, many of us uh, consume and buy handcrafted uh, products. So on almost on a daily basis, I can have a conversation with somebody who's surprised to learn that perhaps what they're wearing is not necessarily benefiting the person that the marketing materials share. So that's really the underlying basis, what motivates us to continue doing this work. And, um, and I'm really tonight going to be moderating this conversation with uh, several people who could, could be here. So I will um, first welcome uh, Ruth Degolia uh, to share her remarks. The, the format for the evening is We've invited each panelist to uh, speak for no more than five minutes, give an overview addressing his growth good vis-a-vis -vis their organization, or in the case of our colleague Rai, um, from his, his uh, standpoint as a scholar and, and educator. So Ruth will come up, uh, and then we'll hear from uh, Jules, and then Ellen, and then Karai, and then we'll all sit and have a panel, and then we'll uh, have time for Q&A, after which, um, we hope that you will also stay and celebrate with us with uh, a cup of wine or sparkling water. So thank you, Ruth, so much for being here. Well, 
Well, thank you so much for having me here tonight. It's wonderful to see so many people that are excited about supporting the artisan sector in this work and research on this work. Uh, to give you kind of the Cliff Notes version of Mercado Global and what we do, we are a nonprofit social enterprise. We work with indigenous women in rural Guatemala. So to give you a sense of the population we work with, we work with a population of women, most of whom have never had the chance to go to school and in a region where public education largely is not free. So one of the key battles that the women we work with are fighting to earn an income with a lack of education, a lack of opportunity, um, and also fighting to earn income to send their kids to school themselves, particularly their daughters. And we work in a region where two out of three indigenous children go to bed hungry every single night. So the poverty is extreme, the malnutrition is extreme, so it, it, it creates a lot of urgency for our work. But the big idea behind Mercado Global is that indigenous women, rather than be seen as victims of poverty, of a lack of education, of racism, of sexism, that they could be some of the best rural entrepreneurs in the world. And we're working to make that vision a reality by helping these women um, sell to some of the top retailers in the fashion industry internationally. So here in the U.S., our biggest clients include Stitch Fix, Free People, Levi Strauss, Nordstrom, Reformation, um, lots of hotel chains, lots of other retail chains. And what's really exciting is to do that not in a way that's just kind of a one-off purchase around the holidays, but it, to be incorporated into their core supply chain on an ongoing basis so, and showing these big retailers that they can have profits through principles and give consumers a chance to buy products to help empower moms in rural Guatemala. So it's exciting, that's what we do. We focus primarily on handbags, um, small, small leather goods, travel items, expanding them to other categories as well. Um, our specialty is from a business perspective, about two thirds of our sales are to big retail chains. So we do most of our business is business to business, um, about 10% of sales are direct to consumer, and it's really about helping the mainstream fashion industry use their market share, use their supply chain to have a positive impact. So that's kind of what we do in a nutshell. Hope that was under three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, up next, I'd like to welcome Jules Fengar. Jules is, Jules is co-founder and creative director of Duca. Hello, everyone. Um, it's great to be here with all of you. I couldn't agree with Ruth's comments more about how exciting all of this is. And we share a lot of similarities in the background environment to where our um, women work and the struggles they face. Um, I'm going to ask you all to bear with me a little bit as I just returned from seven months in Kenya a little bit over 24 hours ago, so <laughs> there's a little bit of jet lag going on here, um, and it's my first Monday away from our team and a location that has a motto, Ole Ole which translates into slowly, slowly. Uh, so as you can imagine, it's uh, quite a shame to face. Um, but so who are we? What do we do? Why am I here? Why do I care about these things? Um, so as mentioned, I'm Jules Behar. I'm the co-founder and creative director of Duca, an ethical fashion and manufacturing company based in rural coastal Kenya. Specifically, we work with traditional local textiles that are sourced by a network of women. And we then aggregate those textiles, archive them, and upcycle them into a range of products from fashion accessories to home goods, trying to utilize every piece of these beautiful fabrics. Um, we've chosen to approach growth not through the number of people we employ, but through the impact we have on those employees, our impact on the environment, and our ability to appropriately delegate resources to cultural preservation. Um, our company philosophy is to view growth as continual improvement to our business practices 
and to employ no more than 10 full-time um, team members at one time. This is what we believe we can do well and what allows us to offer sustainable long-term <coughs> training and employment to our team in a positive work environment. This number does not include the network of women who source our textiles or others who are positively affected by our business, such as local businesses, transport, and handyman, as well as the world and the environment. Um, many of our team members began with no prior experience in tailoring and now have a life skill they can take with them, affording them choice in human right that is really cannot be measured. I can happily say that all of our tailors, school age children are enrolled in school. Our tailors receive recruitment offers as the quality of their skill is locally known. And we have truly reached our zero waste policy, receiving more inquiries for textile scraps than we are able to fulfill, which is really exciting. And staying small allows this to be possible for us. <coughs> Um, I'm looking forward to exploring the complex issue of growth with Ruth and Alan and Cynthia, Bobber, all of you, um, because you know it is a really complex issue. But I would like to be clear that while staying small has been what works for Duca and what we choose to continue on with, that we don't think it's the only way to approach operating in the artisan sector and it just really depends on what your core values as a founder are or what your business model is and um, what impact needs to you. So that's that's a little bit about us and uh, I'll take my seat. <laughs> Thank you. I'd like to welcome Helen Fish to the podium. Ellen uh, has many hats. Um, we, our case study focuses on Friends of Tolonia. She's also the founder of the Sprout Enterprise Network. Um, and just it over. Yes. <coughs> All right. Um, 1982 is when I first went to Tolonia, which is what is, the, is a village in. Rajasthan in India, and how does a girl from small town Wisconsin end up in India, and then 20 years later starting an enterprise or working there? So I'm going to take a bit of a different approach. I'm going to assume you will read the case study and learn about the business. I'm going to be a little more philosophical and pol probably political. Stick um, with the microphone. Uh, stick with the microphone. Sorry about that. Uh, there we go. Let's put it down a bit. So I have a series of keywords that I'm going to share. First one is improv. There's a lovely little book called The International Bank of Bob, which is written by Bob, who is a travel writer, uh, or is a travel writer, travels around the globe, has a crisis of consciousness, if you will, in terms of the lifestyle he was living, and starts giving money to Kiva, and then proceeds to visit the various Kiva investees who get the loan. And it's sweet, but before, and it's a lovely read, so I re recommend it. Um, before he became a travel writer, he was working, um, or part of, working in improv, working as an actor at Second City in Chicago. And one of the rules of improv is to create the story and the interaction. It's always yes and. It's a very affirmative kind of thing. And so my first word tonight is improv. My second word is community. I grew up, as I mentioned, in small town Wisconsin. <laughs> Given my age, it was before the internet, before cable TV, before we even had a single telephone line. It was a party line that we shared with other families. And one black and white TV channel. And my parents were teachers. They grew up on farms in southwestern Wisconsin. All my aunts and uncles were farmers. And that lifestyle, that very close to the land, agrarian, your neighbors probably a mile away, um, kind of lifestyle is all about self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and a certain frugality. 
we all had gardens, we all picked tomatoes and canned them and picked berries and made our own jam. My grandmother made rugs out of scraps of fabric. I learned to knit and sew and crochet. I sewed my own clothes in high school. I even collected clay from a, from a stream and made little terracotta pots. So I was a crafter very early on. Um, before it was a DYI hashtag, <laughs> and it was just something you did to extend your budget. My third word is trust in yourself, in each other, and I was something of a global nomad, again, before it was a thing, before it was a hashtag. My father, as a teacher, was participating in a University of Wisconsin Ford Foundation project in northern Nigeria when I was 10, and we were living there um, and it was probably my first, Ruth was talking about extreme poverty, that was my first encounter with extreme poverty. Poverty is so extreme that you have babies with swollen bellies. And, uh, so <laughs> very rusty red hair. And so basically malnourished. Every Friday was a day that people came by for alms and you saw the, the victims of tuberculosis that had gotten defigured because they lose the nerve sensitivity, so they burn themselves and then it doesn't get treated and they're losing fingers and toes and things like that. Blind men who were being paraded around by little children, they'd seen their praises and asked for alms. So that had a very, <laughs> Impact, significant impact on my view of worlds, particularly coming from a very small town, wonder bread kind of existence. Um, and I had a thirst for travel. I, before college, I went to Mexico on a summer homestay. After college, I went to Thailand and taught English. In 1980, um, I was working in Boston after college and looking for a job, um, applied for business you know, took the GMATs, applied to business school, and applied to the U.S. Foreign Service. <laughs> and again, it's kind of that yes and. The Foreign Service came and said, do you want to do this? Do you want to join us in September? Be before I heard from anybody else. So it was, yes, I'll do that. Uh, this was the era, tail end of the Carter administration. Iran hostages were still in Iran. Um, and I was in D.C. for training. My first post overseas was India, um, and eventually Liberia before coming, before coming back to New York. 1982 in India, Indira Gandhi is Prime Minister, Ronald Reagan is President, the US government is selling F-16s to Pakistan, and I have the dubious pleasure of defending our foreign policy in that scenario. Public diplomacy, arranging events and programs, and press events. And I first went to Tolonia then. Uh, the founder uh, Bunker Roy, of the Barefoot College, Bunker Roy, and his wife were young leaders at the time that were on the radar screen of the US Embassy and the American Center. And so they were people that we cultivated a relationship with professionally and officially um, and invited to events with the ambassador. And then went from there to Liberia, did an MBA, worked on Wall Street, but I went back to India in 1998 on a personal visit, had stayed in touch with friends and folks in India, so I went to Tolonia. And I was working in financial information services at the time, and Bunker is classic social entrepreneur who can galvanize resource and volunteers. Says, can you help us put up a, bare, a Barefoot College website? And by now you know my answer, yes, I can help with that. And then he, uh, well, pull the book out, but there's a Barefoot College craft book. And he starts waving it around, says, can we, can we sell our crafts online? And the answer is, yes, and let's see if we can do that. From the Barefoot, from the Tolonia.com, which still runs today with a team that's on the ground, we stock and ship from Tolonia. There's a team that we've trained over the years who, who handle the word fulfillment. Somebody else came to me and said, would you work with us the way you're working with Tolonia.com? I said, yes, let's do that. 
And so that's where Sprout Enterprise comes. We needed a broader brand for working with multiple artists and enterprises. And it becomes much the similar kind of thing. What are the products? How are they priced? How do you get them to market? I function as a, as a business consultant. I'm something of a startup junkie, so that I'm always intrigued how to help businesses grow. And Sprout Enterprise has now morphed into work um, on the side work collaboration with a, a startup called Powered by People that is a, a digital platform on a B2B basis. Um, so all of what I do is from the framework of supporting friends and family and what they do. They say, can you? And I say, sure, let's, let's see what I can do. Fourth word, integrity. So I'm not about selling products, endless endless products to get rich. That's not my starting point. For me, it's about building relationships, being part of a community and a family, respecting each other, learning a mindset. And so much of this work, I think, is a mindset. Poverty is a mindset. It's a mindset that we're rich and they're poor. It's an us and them dichotomy that I think is wrong. I also have come to think that poverty is systemic. We create victims of poverty. If we do not ensure everyone is educated or properly nourished, that has health services or economic opportunity, we've created those victims. We've created those poor people. And the communities that, Ruth is, that all of us are working with are marginalized communities. They don't have access to education. They don't have access to good health care. And that's a downward spiral, as you probably know. The, the fellow who's director of Brennan Center for Justice has a quote that says, the opposite of poverty is not wealth, it's justice. So I really believe that. Final word is dignity. Everyone has value, in my point of view. Everyone deserves to be treated with respect. And the whole question of scale of big versus small is, <laughs> I put it in a Star Wars analogy, it's Earth Village versus Evil Empire. Um, we all root for the small guy. And part of that, I think, is because we recognize, sure, there's good things. Good, I could not have traveled without airlines, and I couldn't be doing what I'm doing without the internet and cell phones. But the bigger you get, it's a disconnect from our sense of community. The distance, and whether you're talking big ag and our food that's coming from a big ag system versus food that's grown in my garden, whether it's big ag or big pharmacy, big government, big corporations, big and scale has its own machinery and it has its own mechanisms. It's a systemic thing that you have to address and tackle. Um, and it's not, you know, we have to keep in mind that industrialization is part of what drove imperialism, colonialism, and even our war economy, right? That many of these indigenous communities were pushed out of the areas that they were in Mexico, up in the mountains, away from the conquistadors, in India, it's a similar thing, the Mughal invasion and indigenous communities exited to the mountains. So they are marginalized on all level, all sorts of levels, economic, caste, race, language. Um, and to me, it's the amazing thing about craft is the power of craft and culture, that heritage and tradition, those stories, those motifs that pass generation to generation to generation. Um, I, live, I have lived, I'm living a life of improv. I have the social and economic freedom, freedom to travel and work as I do. Uh, that yes and is an optimism. It's an optimistic look at the world. It says it's hopeful. Kodai Kaliskan. Kodai um, is a colleague in the School of Design Strategies here at Parsons. He's Associate Professor of Strategic Design and Management and um, an, an author and scholar who has worn many hats. And uh, when, I, when we were planning this event, uh, when I stopped in front of my door where I have a poster for the event, 
And he was like, is growth good? Let me tell you a story. <laughs> so I'm hoping he will uh, bring his storytelling power here. And thank you so much for being here. Um, I may tell the story in Q&A, so I have a very good story, but uh, tonight I'll try to address your question, is growth good? Um, it refers to two things, archaeology um, and uh, anthropology. So I'm going to be talking about empirical research about how to address this. The idea of growth is very new, it's less than 50 years old, and it's attached actually to the idea of the economy. You may think that the economy as a concept is a very old thing, like Roman economy, Ottoman economy. It's not, actually. Empirical research of Tim Mitchell from Columbia University showed that it was very new, and it by and large emerged around 1930s and saturated right after the Second World War in the post-colonial context when nation-state economies were emerging and institutions like IMF and World Bank was trying to keep them under control. In colonial times, the idea of the national economy didn't exist in the imagination of many people, including economists. Economists had an interesting idea of thinking about the world of what they called the economy as a system and they thought that it draw on a number of principles that are empirically identifiable. But their assumptions did not draw on anything empirical we knew. They borrowed everything from physicists. Equilibrium, stability, elasticity, inflation, expansion, contraction, distribution, movement, friction, and our question, growth. However, there was one problem that mathematicians did not agree with economists, and they have been telling them that, look, the, the math we're using right now in understanding physical phenomena draws on a material understanding of limit, whereas your understanding of economic growth or expansion did not draw on anything material. So there is some problem with your understanding of math. You assume that you can actually externalize material limits to growth, like this planet, to outside of your frame of explanation, and then imagine that you can actually describe it in your scientific realm of explanation. And then economists thought that oh, that was a small problem. We can fix that. And they began to think about growth as if it was possible without incorporating material limits of our economies and sociological context of its making. That's why I didn't study economy, I studied economic sociology to understand processes of economization. That's why I studied markets on the ground. The second research that I want to refer to is from anthropology. It's anthropology of development carried out by Princeton economic anthropologist Julia Yashar on a craftsmanship in Cairo, about artisans in Cairo. As you know, after 1980, a World Bank and IMF induced reform to develop small producers, artisans, and craftsmen depended on an idea of debt. Our idea of growth in today's economy is also to grow, draw on an idea of debt because we create money is dead, and without creating it, we can't grow. So actually, grow is about growing of a non-existent economic value that we believe that it's going to happen in the future. So all these like ultra-rational economies that is supposed to be growing on materialities on the ground, believes on belief, very much like Islam, which grows on belief. So you need to actually imagine and mobilize a story for this to, to happen. So the, the idea of um, growth it was necessarily attached to your imagination of the economy and its material existence, although its understanding of expansion did not draw on anything material. Whatever that draws on materiality, like planet, like environment, like women's labor, this and that, was drawing on a realm they call externality. 
when it came to artisan, uh, artisanal growth in Cairo, that was induced mostly with reference to IMF and World Bank induced neoliberal growth. They produced economic, cultural, and social dispossession, an, an empirical result that did not, that was not contested by World Bank and IMF. And actually, one of the World Bank um, development experts published an article in the in International Journal of Middle East Studies in 2002 showing that effectively World Bank reforms that drew on growth and debt actually contributed to underdevelopment of Egyptian economy from agriculture to artisans. So the growth as we know it is not even an answer for development economists. Empirically speaking, that was not a theoretical point. It failed. It will fail because it draws on an imagination of expansion that is not limited by materialities that designers and craftsmen and small work workshop owners touch every day that make this world possible. And scientifically, it's a dead end. It's not a political choice. So if this is the case, what could be done, we can discuss in q &A. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brian. Um, so we've structured the event a little bit like our case studies are structured, where the case study gives you an introduction to the organization, a bit about the founder's story, and on the back cover of each case study, there's a set of reflection questions. And the idea is that the case studies be the beginning point of conversations or of uh, lessons for those of you who are educators or sharing for those of you who are founders or uh, mentoring for those of you who uh, mentor uh, young founders. Um, so I'm going to sit over there. We'll uh, have uh, some questions and then we'll open it up for today. Thank you all um, so much for the introductory remarks. Um, and I think it's a great segue uh, from Karai's remarks to really dive a little bit deeper on the question of growth. And what I've, uh, and, and what the team, what we've noticed um, as we're profiling and, and speaking with various artisan uh, support organizations, companies, uh, designers, is that um, there seems to, uh, for everyone we've spoken with, there seems to be a commitment to uh, growing. There are always more people to serve more poverty to be alleviated, and therefore more products must be sold. And this seems to be the, the solution um, that, that we've kind of landed on, uh, that, that the marketplace seems to be responding to. Um, and so I'm here with uh, three founders who I know have been quite thoughtful about the issue and challenge of scale. And um, in particular, I'm interested in you commenting on how scale and true partnership with the artisan, indigenous, marginalized communities with whom you're working perhaps go hand in hand. That it is at a small, smaller scale where artisans can participate, can co-design, can help lead, can be mentored to decide how much they can scale, as opposed to some of the other um, companies that we're seeing that uh, come in with big investments that require scale from the beginning, as opposed to a slow bottom-up or from the ground up um, scaling. Um, I think that Duca has the smallest uh, scale currently uh, represented in the conversation, um, and Friends of Tolonia probably the largest. So we've also <coughs> picked our, our, well, from the three of you who are here, um, picked our panelists today so that they can represent that, those stories of scale. Um, so any of you can jump in, Helen? Sure. sure. I'd like to separate the notion of growth from scale. Okay. Um, because I think that as enterprises, as businesses, you need some level of growth to sustain the business itself. Um, when we first started working in Tolonia, it was an income generating project and not sustainable, not self-sufficient, not self-sustaining. And so growth goal in that case was to 
grow revenues slowly but steadily so that the revenues were sufficient to cover the costs and maintain a level of, of consistent income for the artisans working with it. So that growth can be big, it can be small. I don't think of growth as the same thing as scaling. Um, I think there's a lot of talk about scaling or scaling up, particularly in social enterprise space. Um, and there, you know, I, there's a whole host of, of study and research and sort of impact investing in social enterprise space and lots of discussion around that. Scale, again, comes from, I think, the mindset of, again, big, big corporations or people who have scaled a business successfully and donated to a foundation. Their secret of success has, and building their wealth for that foundation has been scaling. And so they, and often it's, you know, a techni technologically driven scale. And so there's a, a predisposition, there's a mindset looking for scale. Our venture capital structures are geared to that hockey stick rapid scaling um, and has not proven a good model. So there are other, there are alternative financial models out there. There are play, players in the impact investing in social enterprise space who are working at looking at other financing and investment vehicles so that your growth is, you know, Uncommon Cacao is, a, is one example in terms of, of there isn't um, an IPO at the end of the, the structure or merger and acquisition. So the venture capital model doesn't work and you have to grow. So there are revenue based models that are considered quasi equity and I'm getting deep in the weeds, some of the details, um, but there's a lot around that in terms of scaling versus growth to sustain your business. Sorry. <laughs> I can go on and on and on and on. Uh, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Um, well, I think there are quite a few issues brought up in, in the initial question. Just a few thoughts on, on one piece of it, which is uh, the, the growth question. Um, what I've seem to be successful uh, is to be rooted first and foremost in what is your what are the goals of your enterprise, what is your mission, and then the, the next question is what are the strategies that will best allow you to achieve that mission and those goals. Um, for us, growth has been a, um, a, a strategy that we've, we've committed to over the last couple of years because one of our co core goals has been sustainability, both in terms of financial sustainability and in terms of um, reducing uh, dependence on the founder. And um, so for us, we've been working hard to, we're structured as a nonprofit with the dual income model, and we've been working to grow our sales program to the point where uh, it doesn't rely on fundraising to sustain it as much. Um, so I think I think what's difficult is regardless of if you're in the, when it comes to art, the artisan enterprise sector, regardless of if you're structured as a nonprofit or as a for-profit or as a hybrid, there's just tremendous pressure to do growth, um, which I think has accelerated over the, even the last couple, like two years. Um, if you're structured as a for-profit, so many, so many of the financial products that might be needed to finance sales or um, to, you know, to invest in achieving other goals of your enterprise, uh, are predicated on committing to growth as a strategy. And certainly if you're structured as a nonprofit, I mean, we increasingly have donors, some of our bigger donors that are actually, will literally give us metrics of how many, you know, artisans we have to serve per X amount donated. Um, and so I think, you know, this is an issue that's such a huge issue when it comes to the artisan enterprise sector, but it's also an issue that's broader to the nonprofit sector as a whole. And one thing that I worry a lot about is I don't want the artisan enterprise sector to go the route of microcredit, where I think a lot of wealthy donors, many of whom had a background in finance or investing, came in and were like, this is a panacea, like, we get it, you, you know, don't lend money and everything's fine. And, you know, we work working in Guatemala, you see the fallout of that. You see families that have lost their home because they took out five different loans with different microcredit organizations. The average APR for microcredit loan in Guatemala is 35%, and that's 
that's 15 points below the international average for microcredit loan. This is not a panacea. Good work has been done, but it's not a panacea. And I think likewise um, with artists and enterprise sector, you know, we need the resources and the tools um, you know, of other sectors, but forcing this growth, for, forcing a growth-based model has a lot of problems. And you know, when it comes to metrics, it, it really, it always blows my mind when I see, you know, uh, to think how, uh, we, there is a donor who has been very, very successful and run many Fortune 500 and Fortune 100 companies that you would be familiar with, who takes that model and then thinks, you know, is just totally committed now for every three, every three hundred dollars that I donate, want to have impacted one person. And so then you look at what models does that work with? Well, it's it's really like a handout model, where you hand out a water filter, you hand out some other product. Does that change the life of the person who received it? You know, um, so not that those questions shouldn't be asked, but it is complex. That said, I don't see growth as necessarily bad. I see growth like globalization or access to global markets as a neutral impact tool that is, it becomes either good or bad based on how it's deployed. Um, so for us, you know, we, we hope that it's been helpful because it's helped us increase the, the financial sustainability of our sales program, but it certainly has had drawbacks and when we've been pushed to growth too fast, um, that's been really problematic. Tools, did you yeah. Want? So that was a lot to process. with all really fascinating. Is this? Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, so for us, again, as I'm sure we are the smallest scale company on this panel. Um, the topic earlier was brought up about everyone having value and seeing artisans as equals. And when we entered this project. To be honest, I did think that we would, or my original intention was probably to scale to a larger level than what we ended up choosing to stay with. But um, one of the main reasons we have chosen to remain with 10 employees is that I think a lot about what I want in a work environment, and it is things like morale, a happy workplace, office perks, um, all sorts of things that I don't think are often addressed when you look at the artisan sector. It's simply looked at as um, raising these women out of the poverty level and they can send their kids, kids to school, that's enough. Um, often people just think, oh, it's so great, they have a job. They don't think about what the quality of that job is. We all are becoming more and more aware of this issue through some great documentaries panels such as this, um, books, um, but I think that, again, for me, as I was there on the ground working with these women and seeing specific conditions, I wanted a better toilet, so that was something we decided to invest in for all of us in revamping our bathrooms, um, providing stuff, showers, doing things that we wouldn't have been able to do if we employed more than 10 women, really became a priority to me. Um, so those are things that I just care deeply about and I think I would care deeply about if I ran a fashion-based business here in the States as well. So it just goes back to that, that question of core values and how you want to run your business and also to the issue that was brought up of risk. For me, bringing this um, opportunity to women to work and put their skills to good use um, wasn't something we took lightly and introducing them to a market in the States wasn't something we took lightly and I knew that I wouldn't be comfortable taking money from investors or taking out a loan and going into debt, potentially growing to a scale that we couldn't sustain and letting these women go after making false promises to improve their life and ultimately not improve their life. So that's, that's
That's where we come from. Thank you. <laughs> Could I do the one? I can say something about the. Yeah. Um, there are discursive things that are traps in discussing things like is development good? <clears throat> it's such a discursive intervention that you can't say no. It's like, oh, oh workers for not development. I mean, people would laugh at you. Right? So, discussing the question, growth is good or not, is not a good question. It's a wrong question because it, it invites you to think in the terms of an economist. My friend said it's very nice. If it depends, the question is wrong. It's like, what should we do to help women drive their cars as good as men? This is not a question. This is a patriarchal intervention in belittling women. And to be honest, empirically speaking, women drive better. If you look at their dividends, insurance dividends, people who die in their accidents and people got injured, it's like a fraction of what men kills in roads. So um, my proposition is that one has to be careful in thinking with the magician's tricks. Economists used a design intervention to explain that economies are not designed. They use supply and demand graphs to explain what they call the market. And I was trained in options and futures trainer, trader, and I wrote an ethnography of a global market. The first thing that you learn if you're a real market actor is to stop thinking about the economies. The first thing in microeconomics in trade. So if I may give an empirical example, um, can I talk about my initiative, my money? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I, I worked with home cooks uh, in Istanbul. And um, we put together a company. I'm the chief financer and also the owner of the liability, the majority owner. And I work with a number of people, a data scientist, a technology officer, a computer scientist. And we uh, put together a, a, an innovation for women who would like to sell their produce as artisanal cooks, but they didn't want to open restaurants. However, we had a limit. When we met them, their main idea was like, we don't want to be a part of the formal sector. We are like, what, what, why? They said, because our insurance are from our husbands. They were mostly married. And if we are in the formal sector, we are going to be paying taxes. And for social uh, benefits, we are going to be paying this and that. So in the end, we are not going to be able to make money. So, I can't do that, and there's no childcare, so I have to be home. And then we put together an idea where we can dem demarcate different forms of economization. So we formed a women's cooperative and a limited liability company, made limited liability company a, a member of the cooperative, so that women began to sell to limited liability ca company without uh, showing them as either trader or worker, thus formalizing economically, shielding them with cooperative, and the limited liability to begin to sell it to directly to producers, because cooperatives cannot sell directly as a market being. In the end, we began to have 120 women working for that, and we had to ask two of them to leave, because they grew. <laughs> we realized they were selling food that was more than they could cook. So they opened their restaurants. So growing was bad for this platform economy initiative. And then everyone was telling us that, oh, entrepreneurship is really good. You really are making women entrepreneurs. I said, I'm not believing in entrepreneurship or entrepreneurialism. I don't think in these middle of the world terms. I am believing in empowerment. And this is the women. This is, these are the concepts that women are using. So it is not entrepreneurship and whatever. And next week, we got Microsoft's Entrepreneurship of the Year Award. <laughs> so the powerful, the corporation, the company was like, come to my terms. I'm going to tell you that you have to be indebted. I'm going to tell you that, oh, get this $300 grant. No women got any debt. They were not indebted. And they owned their cooperative. And we 
propose the economic architecture of the engagement so that without women's labor, there is a liability doesn't um, work. So there are many possibilities that could be done, and our imagination is limited by those discourses, very much like patriarchy, very much like economism, very much like developmentalism. If I can give a fantastic example in 30 seconds, imagine when you're talking about economies in the world, compared to political economies, developing countries and developed countries, right? And there's nothing wrong with discussing about. Let me tell you what's wrong talking about this this way. Imagine we think about stratification in a given society, and we're, we're studying poverty and economic inequality in a given society. And then I come here and say, oh, there's a fantastic way of talking about inequality in a given society. Let's call one group of people rich people, and the other group people who are getting rich. <laughs> You would think that I'm like, I'm like, you know, making fun of you. I mean, what am I? I mean, after so many PhDs, really? You can talk about people as rich people and getting rich people? When we do it for economies, we take it for granted. You cannot talk about development without colonialism, without imperialism, without international relations of domination. As easy as that. This is the case for Little small economies and large economies. If this is the case, why are we using that wrong language? And I really learned a lot from feminist political economists who actually trained us, is retrained us in this. Like you know, um, um, like the end of capitalism as we knew it. J.K. Gibson Graham. They pretend as if they are white men. They're actually two women writing about economies. They use a pen name to be taken seriously by the world of economists. And we learned that there is another possibility. And, and your panel and this question is a fantastic, I believe, conversation in imagining those possibilities. It's a very elegant circle from saying it's the wrong question. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great beautiful panel. question. Um, so I, you know, I, I really appreciate, uh, and, and our team has appreciated in our conversations with you all. So we started the process by doing interviews, we had a template of questions we were asking, and then we, as a team, started developing the story, Robert always taking the first stab at that. Um, and uh, I was always very moved by how centered the, the artisans were in our conversations. Um, and we very much didn't want to have a series uh, about organizations, but we're really, as a lab, very interested in artisans and their children is, is kind of our framing. So we're not so interested in the products, we're not so interested in the organization, but really centering the artisans. Um, and so I'm, I'd love for, for each of you, for, um, for Ruth, uh, Jules, and Ellen, to share a little bit about what we've learned with the case studies before we open it up for Q&A, which is um, if the marketplace were to die and there were no more products to be sold and therefore perhaps uh, less incentive to make uh, products on the artisan end, can you tell us one or two strategies you've implemented and how you've gone about your organization and way of working that ensures that the artisans will have something left behind? That even if that if that yeah that that sales channel closes and you have to kind of close up shop and start to do something else, that the artisans aren't just left with less than where they were when when we all started the work. I'll start with that one. Um, having just gotten back from spending so much time with our women, so when we started with the team that we have. Now, many of them did not know how to sew, and they received their sewing machines as incentive to attend an adult education program. I saw very quickly that this was something that was a nice concept, but that they didn't really know how to use these machines, and they did not have the market for them. The main strategy we employed was knowing that they had the skill they could take with them to their homes. We aren't pulling them out of their homes. They're remaining in their local villages where we've based our manufacturing workshop 
And the other strategy um, that we've done is offer courses from having partners come in to speak about health to language programs should they choose to participate. But we also haven't tried to change their way of living in any dramatic way that, or in any way that, I guess this goes back to the thing about Western presumption um, or uh, how we approach developing and development. Mm -hmm. We haven't, well, we want their lives to be changed and improved. We haven't tried to westernize their lives, is what I should say. Um, many of them live in traditional dwellings, and I think that often people see these dwellings and think, oh, these women, they live in a mud hut. But really, these huts are made in a way that is um, the most logical for climate control. They're made out of neem trees, which have a bunch of healing properties, and you look at the way we live and our, um, you know, uh, furniture and things that come with cancer warnings and whatnot, and you think, what really is the better way to live here? So that's my answer to that. Ruth, sure. Um, so this is a question we think about a lot, um, and we see ourselves as a path, as kind of a step in the development process or as a tool that women can use in our partner communities to create the type of life that they want for themselves and their families. And we don't see ourselves as necessarily the end state or the end goal, but rather the organization is a tool to get to where people might want to be. Um, and so one, pe one very big piece of our model uh, in the US kind of publicly, we're, we're known for our market access program, our sales program, because that's what's most visible, but actually the vast, you know, most of our, more of our staff are in our community-based education program and our technical training program. And what we're doing is teaching women, we have whole, you know, a series of curriculum that we focus on, but it kind of boils down to the tools need to, needed to run their own businesses um, and the tools needed to cre create the kind of change they want in their own lives. And, the kind of life they want for their families. So everything from self-esteem training to leadership training to um, we do curriculum actually on the process of goal setting and thinking about what do you want and then how do you achieve that goal. So we know and we actually have been playing with the idea of um, creating a graduation based model where actually um, artists, we are, artisans are only able to work with us for a certain period of time with the goal of getting them to the point in their businesses to the point where they don't need us anymore. Um, and so we can move on and help other communities that are trying to create their own community-owned businesses. Um, so, you know, those tools, uh, those skill sets are things that we would leave. The tools we help women get, the big focus on our asset development program and helping women build their own savings and get access to technology that they own, income generating technology that they own. Um, and we also teach them to build local markets. So that's something that we're still continuing to build that program, but we encourage all of our partner co-ops to sell locally, to sell elsewhere. A lot of our sewing co-ops do have businesses as seamstresses. Um, a lot of our weaving co-ops sell clothing, traditional clothing, locally competition from China and from uh, factory made uh, knockoffs of traditional clothing is a, is a big issue on that currently. But um, yeah, so our, our hope is that uh, we eventually won't be needed in the communities that we work with and, and we work with that advice. Sure. I'll echo that in the sense that I've always perceived my role as working myself out of a job. Um, I'm not, I'm there. Um, and I've been you know, committed to this for 20 years. They're certainly working with Tony about 22, actually. Um, but but I Sprout Enterprises, a big brand is their sort of meta brand. It's not the only brand. I expose the artisan brand. They're they're talked about on my website. There's a link to their own website. Um, I facilitate a sale. I sometimes function as a manufacturer's sales rep to get the order, the relationship started. Um, but if there's a 
the capability by the artisan or the entrepreneur to manage that relationship directly, I don't stand in the way of that. I help make that happen, which is a luxury of my structure as a nonprofit. Um, it would be a terrible strategy if I were making this a business because I would be giving my source and suppliers away. Um, but from my perspective, my role is to help them succeed as, and, and become self-sustaining as a business. And, and that's the case of Sprout Enterprise. In the case of Tolonia, we've trained a team there. Um, and so initially there was someone here helping support the order fulfillment and the customer service. Now there's a team that does that on the ground. I provide kind of a U.S. point of contact. Um, you know, I take the returns that we ship directly from there. Um, so I, I facilitate communication. But if there are buyers from Australia or UK, I facilitate an in introduction to the team in Tulonia and they handle that piece. I think the, so that's a, I'm not there permanently. Um, the second piece, and I think this is kind of, um, the local markets have become, over 20 years, the local markets have become a better and bigger opportunity than the international <coughs> export sales. So within, um, we work a lot, uh, with, I work with a number of groups in Oaxaca, um, and there's a little ecosystem um, that's developing. So the folks who are making the glass and the pottery are collaborating in terms of finding solutions that reduce their energy costs. So they've moved from propane to fire the glass furnaces to creating the technology, basically, of creating the innovation that allows them to use methane um, from waste vegetable oil. They collect waste vegetable oil from the various restaurants in Oaxaca to fuel the furnaces. Um, they also have worked with a team of German research students, engineering students, to develop a, uh, a bio <laughs> manure, basically, right? They're using, um, it's that farm quality that I love. Um, so they have a biodigester that is generating methane. Um, they're working with solar energy because energy costs become a really big chunk of the cost in production. Um, and so they're collaborating into the innovations that the, the glass studio has come developed. They're now working with other craft industries. So it's with the ceramics group um, and they're using waste agricultural product, waste ag um, agricultural material to make briquettes for making charcoal to to fuel the kilns for firing the pottery. They're using a mix of um, the the methane and and wood to reduce the need for wood in um, distilling mezcal. Um, and there's a lot of artisanal product production. They're working with the local paper producer to do their packaging. Um, and so there's a local economy that's generated. The group that I'm working with in northern India is doing a similar kind of thing, where the dependency, and again, this goes to the point of material limitations. All of these groups are figuring out innovation around that limitation, so that there's, Avani is using solar power and has, and that's they, they actually started the textile business to generate income so that the communities would have the cash income to pay a, a, part, a, a fee into helping support it. So nothing is given away. There's not a handout. All of the enterprises have a contribution coming from an, from an artisan. So the solar energy they needed an income to pay for some solar electrification in the, in the communities. And so textiles was generated and developed, that enterprise was developed. The textiles they use are using natural fibers and natural materials, natural dyes from that community to, to do the dyeing. You need energy to heat your water and, and do all of that dyeing process. Um, they have developed um, a pine needle gasification project that, that replaces diesel fuel because not the solar um, was backed up with diesel. Uh, and that gasification 
produces an ash that again is compressed into a briquette that's used for fuel either for cooking or for other production processes. So they've gone from creating sort of a local utility in solar because the grid wasn't there, electric grid wasn't there or wasn't reliable. Um, they developed the textile industry, you know, enterprise to support that. Natural dye and, and pigment business is kind of the next enterprise and the Abadi bioenergy is, is the energy source to that. Um, and so all of those begin to circulate through the economy and farmers are integrated in that they're raising silkworms to generate the silk and so all of the inputs and outputs um, become a it becomes a local ecosystem um, or kind of, you know it becomes a local community and i guess my belief is innovation is going comes from the fringe it comes from the edges and much like um, <coughs> Much like the internet or the web, right? It, 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 it was, it was, it was developed. <laughs> comes out of the army research, right? Because there was the big supercomputers, but they had a single point of failure. So you develop this network approach that does not have a single point of failure. And so my belief in how we need to be going is those little, you know, it's like the web in the sense that there's lots of little servers connected that gives you the computing power. But you can have lots of little ecosystems and production centers that give you the production capabilities um, and you can scale from that replication. There's a, there's a good book called um, Resilience by Andrew Zoli who talks about some of that approach um, and talks about you know, single points of failure. We, we think we have a robust and strong economy but there are these single points of failure. Witness 2008 and the meltdown of our financial system or the Hurricane Sandy floods the electric plant in lower Manhattan without it or the, I forget the year it was, but there's a tree branch that falls in a wire that shorts out the circuit that blacks out the East Coast. Um, there are single points of failure in our systems that are big and scaled um, and seemingly robust, but they're not. Mm -hmm. And so where are those failures and how do we develop um, the networks or the mini grids or the, the, the resiliency uh, in our economies that, that respond to that? Uh, so Thank you. Uh, I think it's a good time to open it up for questions. Uh, I see a couple of hands. Let me pass you the mic. This Thank you for sharing your vision and your accomplishment in, in the field. I have a question about this equation, because you talk about these creators that should be very, very talented, that their output is, well, we haven't talked and seen anything of their artwork, is the base of this conversation, the talent and the legacy of the communities. My question is if you have found something about the consumers, because somebody mentioned the high-end stores in New York, than the new store of 57. So how is the relationship with the consumer and which narrative do you use to convince them to, to invest money? It is the social impact, the balance between social impact or legacy, heritage, or a benchmarking, like for example, when you mentioned the case of Oaxaca, there are many communities, for example, not many, there is a one organization that I know in Peru that they have nine towns, only one with men and eight with women, and they have the decision what to produce, and they have a schools for women who are in charge of the kids when they go to, to sell the product, not at the market, because at the market at 9 a.m., the product costs $100, at midday is going to be 50, and at the 3 p.m. when they have sold anything, it's 25. They decided to have a home, and the people who goes to that home house, they see the value, they eat potatoes and the soup made by the grandmothers, and they pay the $100 because of the social interaction and seeing the reality. So I'm very intrigued about if you have discovered something about consumers across different markets, about different scenarios. I'm happy to, <clears throat> to respond to that. Um, <clears throat> so I think it, there's some variation based on what is your product strategy, what's your 
target customer, what market specifically are you targeting? In general, what we have found is, so first of all, for us to step back, saying that you know, growth is a strategy, but the, you know, the first question is what is your goal and what's the appropriate strategy to achieve that goal? Our goal is uh, fighting poverty. We are not a cultural preservation organization. That for us is a positive externality that comes from uh, fighting poverty through a model that uses traditional techniques and craftsmanship as a way to connect rural communities to international markets. So starting from that point, therefore our goal when we're working with our partner artisans, and, and, and the other thing I would say is for what we do, we believe in value-based um, leadership, and so our core values as, a, as an enterprise are partnership, res respect, and authenticity, and we use those core values to help us figure out the hard questions and make decisions. We have found that when speaking with our partner artisans, that the single thing that they want more than anything else is more orders, more access to income, and that is one of the reasons why growth has been important to us. Um, so if we're trying to maximize the market and, and sales for our partner artisans, for our model, based on the population we're working with, the cost structure in Guatemala, the materials, etc., it was important to develop a model that allowed us to tap into pre-existing retail distribution networks. So basically that's why we focus on partnering with big retail chains. Okay, so with working in Guatemala with these products, we did, I'm sorry, we don't have pictures here. I think I have, I have one, one piece, but it's not a good example because it's really beaten up. But um, I, we found that, you know, for, you know, where we could, our products are not luxury. We can't, you know, sell at parties, which doesn't really exist anymore. Um, you probably wouldn't want to anyway because you couldn't sell very much and they take 12 months to pay, which is part of why they went out of business, but is not unusual for the luxury fashion market. We don't want to sell to Walmart or the bottom of the barrel um, because it's a race to the bottom on price point. We can't pay a fair wage. So we target the middle. That's where we sell to free people, Anthropology, Levi's, uh, Lucky Brand, places like that. Um, so for that market, we have found that first and foremost, the most important uh, feature is design. That the reality is, especially right now in this market, it has to be a great product. The story has to be the icing on the cake. Um, that if we lead just with the story and rely on just the story, unfortunately, just the numbers speak for themselves. Can't sell enough. Can't build a sustainable business model. Um, I'm not aware of any enterprise that has been able to do that sustainably. That said, learning how to tell the story well helps once you have a great product. And um, you know, some of the language used in, in here and the one features that everyone has I think is really helpful. We talk about not, you know, the word poverty porn, that's a great term. Um, Poverty porn doesn't even work when it comes to selling products. Um, talking about heritage, talking about elevated craftsmanship, creating that connection. We talk about connecting the woman who wears it with the woman who makes it, the sort of partnership across the Americas between women who do women accessories. That's powerful, but again, it's not enough to really sell a lot of product at a great markup so that the maker earns a great wage. It has to be a great product, is what we find. There's another question here. <coughs> I didn't hear any of you talk about the market research that you do in order to identify uh, market wants for which your uh, craftspeople could fill. Yeah. Um, and the second part of that is um, uh, somebody mentioned the, the, the one who does the sewing machine. Was that, was that you? Um, uh, but they, they, they went to a public education class to learn how to use a sewing machine. Um, why didn't you provide the whole thing? So that actually wasn't a program provided by us. That was a program provided locally where it was an incentive. It, it wasn't a program to learn how to sew. It was a program to say, we'd like you to come back to school and further your education as women. And if you do this, we'll give you a sewing machine. And then you'll have a job. This is kind of going back to that micro credit, micro finance model of small loans for women. So that wasn't something that we um, came up with. It was just something that we noticed while we were there. And um, 
I come from a fashion background, so I couldn't agree with Ruth more about good design standing out first and foremost. Um, I'm a Parsons alumni, so it's nice for me to be here. My business partner is actually a new school alumni um, with their master's in international development. So long story short, um, I agree with you. That would have been a good strategy. When we brought the women on, we did, they had these machines. We trained them to use them. But another main reason we worked where we were is because of my personal aesthetic happening to, I, I really bonded and with the, the aesthetic that I stumbled across through my travels. And for me, it was just this explosion of color and everything that I really respond to visually as well as storytelling, our textiles, all of these proverbs. So they are in a way a barometer of uh, social life for the women. Um, so in terms of market research, to wrap this up, we really um, didn't do that. We just went on instinct um, as a designer, what I liked, what I thought my friends would like, what people commented on when I was wearing it. And I, as a small business, we've been fortunate enough to um, work with that. and. If we grew, I'm sure we'd have to do more research, but <laughs> we're not. <so. laughs> let, me, let me respond to that a bit. Our, our market research is more sort of market test. One of the advantages of our scale, of small scale artisan production, is it's pretty easy to create a sample and put it up and put it in front of somebody, and if, if, they, if it sells, we make more. Um, with Telonia, we there were, they were already, they already had a craft enterprise going. Um, they had, you know, they were doing, do, we do a lot of the brazai, the, the, the cotton quilts, the block print quilts and block print duvet sets and table linens. Um, and so much of our product development was my bringing a, um, but my friends in India call it the, water, we, we do watered down block print because instead of the rich multicolored layer and layer of color that's, that's frequently done in India, um, we're doing one or two colors. And it's, it's much simpler in, in its approach. And so I'm bringing color. Uh, my intervention design of product was very much just picking color and doing color palettes, following color trends, doing samples. We take a picture, we put it up on the website. If it sells, uh, we start making more of it. Um, and as things, you know, blue, blue and white <laughs> always sells, right? It's sort of, there are some standard things that, that you repeat um, because you've had success and then there are, then you try and, you know, I've become an Instagram junkie because I'm looking at trends and looking at what's out there today, this year is class, you know, Pantone's color of the year is blue. And so we keep an eye on those trends. Uh, we do a few samples. If they start selling, um, we go from there. But, but part of the advantage of scale is this isn't, it's not necessarily a big investment to do product development and, and test out the product. We'll take one last question here. Hi, this question's for Ruth. So um, as a nonprofit, in the ever-changing fashion world and accessories world, um, what are some challenges that you constantly face and how do you aspire to uh, overcome them? Great question. Um, we have lots of different challenges we're always facing, never a dull moment at Propel the Ball. Um, I, I think one actually circles back to the question from the gentleman in the back, um, which is that with you know, the fashion market always changing, we're always thinking about how do we stay in front of that in terms of maintaining sales or growing sales if growth is a strategy, which for us it, it is. And um, I think there are a couple tactics we deploy to, to, to deal with that. One is actually when it comes to market research for us, so I'm not a designer, um, uh, I don't have an MBA, but I, I would say that that, that skill set is what I bring to the organization. And so I've worked to make sure that we 
um, use the same strategies in terms of market research, market analysis, price setting, uh, market feedback loops, building really tight market feedback loops to make sure that we're mitigating risk when it comes to sales and if our goal is growth that we're setting ourselves up to do that successfully. So we, um, we deploy some of the tactics around absolutely we don't have minimum factory runs, we can pilot, we can test new silhouettes, new fabrics with direct-to-consumer sales to, to see how they, they go before we commit to putting it into collection. Um, but we also do things like we form a tight partnership with some of our biggest retailers like Stitch Fix and really closely with them track data about what types of marketing collateral are most effective in, in driving sell-throughs, what types of products silhouettes are selling best, what is the premium we can charge because of the story behind the product, which unfortunately is not very much. Um, and so that we have really concrete data to help guide decision making so that we're designing in a way that's going to achieve our goals as a, as a social enterprise. Um, Can I add one to, the, to that? I think there's a, it, it's back to the question in terms of sort of scale and do you, who do you sell to and, and are, we're structured and people buy our story, right? It's, it's a bigger piece of what we do. Um, but we're selling to small, we're selling, we're selling to individuals directly or we're selling to smaller retailers. In the world, if you're, and we found that for the, 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 the capabilities and skill sets of the groups that we're working with, the size of their production, availability of fabric, um, the, the, you know, small selling to small is a better match for us. You know, I sell five pieces or ten pieces to a small retailer who's seasonal and selling, you know, up in Portland, Maine to summer cottage residents. To what Ruth is doing in terms of selling to a large retailer, it breaks for us. We don't have the quality control, the management skill set in that framework for most of the groups we're working with to make that successful. And that becomes also a question of marketing channels and platforms. For a while, we were at Artisan Resource in New York now. We got orders, and then, oh, look, and we, did, we weren't pre-stocking and, and building inventory, because that takes a lot of your capital. So we were doing pre-orders and doing a made-to-order kind of business. We thought we had three, four month lead time. It would work very nicely, and then the cotton fabric, the cotton workers go on strike and there isn't fabric available. And then the block, <laughs> and all on the same sequence of orders, <coughs> then the block printer's grandmother dies and then that block printing isn't happening for three or four weeks. And so you start adding these delays together <coughs> and I'm calling back the people we sold in February and May to say, I'm so very sorry, I don't have a date for delivery. I'm going to cancel your order, refund the deposit you made. I'll call you when we have it ready. Well, if I've missed the season, the buying season, I'm trying to do delivery in May and June for people who are selling to a summer crowd, they need the product then. They place the order in February. And so we, we get our product in July, and it's like, oh gosh, well, I guess we'll have a sale because it's the seasonal sale time, and so our margins are trashed. Um, and so that's, that's <laughs> it's kind of the lovely learning circle you learn. You learn that block printing doesn't happen in the monsoon season, which is roughly May to September, and so you better have your block print fabric ready in January, February, so you can be stitching through the monsoon. And then there's you know holidays, there's Diwali in November, and there's a period between October and Christmas that nothing happens because everyone's off on holiday. So all of these um, delights, uh, delightful challenges are things you learn over time. And so there's a unlearning, a de-learning. I came out of a successful career in a corporation doing new product launches, but scaling down to you know, sort of solo and a handful of friends and volunteers, it's a very different experience. And then you're also layering on, 
you know, just language and distance and culture. I mean, I'm working with, <laughs> I'm putting together table linens and napkins for working with women who, who eat communally and on the floor, right? Like, what's a table and a napkin for? And why does it need to match? So our, our intervention is making, you know, making sure that we can print the same color to match. So to the question of who buys and is the story important, the people who support us and are buying from us, it works best for us to that individual who, who likes our story, who's the conscious consumer or the motivated consumer or the small business owner who does that. For the world of a Nordstrom's or a Levi's Strip, you know, the, the folks she's dealing with, like, no thank you. I can't, I can't. We can't have any You can't issues. miss. You have a two week window to deliver the goods packed the way it's required to be to the warehouse. And then once the goods are there, you get to invoice. You know, it's, the terms are often net ROG, which is receipt of goods in the warehouse. So it is your 30 day invoice plus the time, lead, the lead time it takes to get it to the warehouse that you're extending credit to the, to the buyer, the wholesale buyer. And because I'm following fair trade principles, I'm extending a, 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 a production advance to the folks I'm working with. It's a 50% so they can buy materials and 50% the, the remainder before it ships. So I'm doing credit to both ends. That's a stretch of working capital that, that we're insane to try and, and, and support, right? So the who do you sell to becomes this dance of who can you afford to sell to? What are the terms that you can work out for the scale, the size of order that you're producing? Where's that working capital coming from? Sorry. It's a good story. Thank so, you. So I'm going to conclude our event here. Thank you very much, Ellen. Um, please uh, help me in thanking Ruth, Jules, Karai, Ellen. Behind-the-scenes colleagues, uh, Alex Fairweather, and our colleagues from IT and Facilities for helping set up the event. And um, I have four requests for everyone who's here. First, we have a blind spot in our series of case studies, and would love introductions to organizations that have been started and are led by artisans. That would be amazing. We'd love to speak with them. Uh, second would love your help in fundraising so we can print our case studies and distribute them to people who are going to learn from uh, those people who have already been working on this for you know the summation of the whole case studies decades probably centuries um, not reinventing the wheel reinventing the wheel is harmful for communities uh, with whom uh, we've been in contact um, the third thing is let people know about this event and the work of the Deep Lab. Uh, we're most active on Instagram, at Deep Lab is our handle. And uh, fourth, please stay and celebrate with a cup of wine. We'd love to say glass, but we don't have glass, we have cups. <laughs> and we're going to, we have a limited run of um, five of the case studies that we've printed. These are, these are proofs from the printer hot off the press today. And we'll um, put them on the table. I ask that you only take one for now because we have such limited numbers. Uh, but again, hoping to, to get them uh, printed uh, at larger scale. Talk about scale and growth um, in the near future. And I'll be uh, posting them on the D website later this week so you can also download and, and print. Um, uh, I know that Ellen also brought a handout from Sprout Enterprise Network. And uh, I look forward to continuing the conversation in our reception. Thank you, everyone.